I'll just remind everyone to mute if you're not trying to ask a question or something. So we don't have background since we have so many people. Um, okay, so Casey and Moriel are here. So I think, and I saw Anne is also here. So I think we're probably good to get started. Um, welcome everyone to the BioCurator Working Group call. We're very excited for this month to have like a nomad centric month. Um, so today we're really going to focus on an overview of the Nomad V4 reference um, database with members of the Nomad team present to tell us about it. And then the next meeting will be really more so focusing on quest a question and answer session. So how to use the resource and questions of how to use the resource and also um, some guidance from ClinGen and the Sequence Variant Interpretation Working Group of how they suggest to use this resource. So we're going to try to make this call today as informational as possible, but really start to think about some of the questions that you may have for the NOMAD team because they'll be present on the next call too. Um, we'll also be sending out a form, um, and I think Kazon can stick this in the chat because she has it on the slides here, um, to collect your questions so that we can prep some answers ahead of time for the next call. So um, we're pretty excited to have the Nomad team here to talk to us about Nomad V4, um, and I will turn it over to them now. Okay, let me just share my screen. Or actually, I think I need sharing still. I'm not sure who can. Okay, I think Kazong's switching you all the co-host permissions. There you go. While we're getting that set up, I'll just echo the, yes, if you can share questions ahead of time, um, because in case we don't have the answers, that gives us the chance to go and try to get them for you before the meeting. And otherwise we'll answer anything that comes up in the meeting um, that we can, but we'll have more knowledge if we know what, ahead of time what's coming. And feel free to take a two, two seconds to give a, an overview of your team, introduce yourselves if you like. I thought I would let you all do it if you would like to do that. I appreciate that. Um, Casey Ann, do you want to go first while I get this up or? Sure. Actually, our second slide is acknowledgments. But um, so I'm Casey for Catherine. I am the product manager of Nomad. Um, and so I work with the production team. So this is a team of computational biologists that is working on the quality control and building of the actual database. And I'm Anna Dalaria. I'm a clinical geneticist and have worked on EXAC and then NOMAD since my postdoc years and have been um, somebody who's kind of on both sides of interpreting variants in clinic and then feeding back to the team. So I'm now on the NOMAD steering committee, but I feel like a lot of what I do is what the, everyone in this group is doing of needing to use the resource. And so if I can't understand it as somebody who works on NOMAD, that means it's probably not clear. So I've, I've been trying to help fill that role and be a good communicator between teams. Morial. Yeah. And my name is Morial, and I fall actually more on the rare disease analysis side of our team. Um, but I like to fondly refer to myself as like one of the main Nomad <laughs> users um, because I do use Nomad as a resource all of the time. And I've been involved with some of the projects that I will be covering here. Um, so hopefully giving my point of view on some of the features that I'll be discussing will be also helpful for this community call. And um, also while we're here, I'll just acknowledge everyone else that's involved with NOMAD. Um, we have the core NOMAD team, but as you can see, there's a lot of names on this screen of people who are involved with making this database what it is today and being able to, for us curators and others to use it. Um, so yeah, just wanna acknowledge the, those people from the get-go. Um, and this is just an overview of what we're going to be covering. Um, I think we'll have some time at the end if there are any immediate questions, but this should take most of the time. Um, I'm going to start with just a quick overview of what is Nomad and what's in this newest release. Um, I'm then going to cover a little bit of how we can use Nomad to evaluate um, variant pathogenicity, especially rare variant pathogenicity. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about different features like constraint and applying those constraint results, as well as statistical phasing, assuming there's time. So that being said, I'll go ahead and get started with what is Nomad, what's in this release. Um, but to understand the genetic variation in one individual, we do need to study the variation found in the entirety of the human population. Um, and really, this data aggregate, genomic data aggregation started back in 2010 with the release of the 1000 Genomes Project, which um, started with about 2,500 genomes being released. And over time, you can see how this has developed to where we are 
today with the um, end of 23 having released this newest version of Nomad um, that contains around 730,000 exome data sets and 76,000 genomes. And in total, this um, V4 launch included around 800,000 individuals, again, with um, those large, <laughs> large subset of exome data, as well as the genome data, mostly coming previously from the Nomad V3 version. Um, the exome data is also including samples from version two, um, but additional samples as well, um, including some from UK Biobank. And the biggest difference between this version of Nomad and prior um, exome versions, at least, is that this is aligned to HG38, so it's on the newest reference. Um, so that's the biggest difference we want to highlight. But also that although there's still work to be done um, in getting more diversity into Nomad, this newest release did provide around three times more diverse individuals than were seen in the V2 version. Um, and around 170,000 of those are inferred non-European samples in particular, which I just want to note here is even more than the total number of samples that were seen in the V2 version. So we're at least getting better in this diversifying this data set. Um, but the scale and diversity that we um, do see in version four does allow us to now on average see about two single nucleotide variants for every three base pairs. Um, this actually equated to around greater than 42 million of variants in V4 um, that had not been detected in previous versions. So we're really seeing a lot more variation that has not been visible, I guess, before. And due to this increased representation of diverse genetic, and this is mostly due to the increased representation of diverse genetic ancestry groups. So obviously with the more diversity, we're able to see more variation overall. And I think um, now I was going to hand it over briefly to Casey to talk about just something that's important about this V4 data set that we're working on updating soon, I think. Yes, so this is a fix coming in in V4. But if you um, have opened the Nomad browser recently, you'll see that the banner has changed. So it used to announce the V4.0 release, and now it talks about an allele number bug. Mm -hmm. So this is just quickly walking through an example of what that would look like. So highlighting here, uh, I've zoomed in on the gene page to the second exon of col 6 a one you can see that it's very well covered. So the coverage plot is, it looks really nice in the exomes. Every, basically every individual has coverage over 20 X. Can you go to the next slide? So then if you look at variants within this, these, uh, this exon, which I've highlighted in this box here and on this table, and then one more slide, you can see that there's a large variability in the allele number at this, in this exon, despite this really even high coverage. And this box in particular is high, highlighting the allele number of three variants within the same codon. And then next slide. Thank you. So this is a bug that we found in V4.0. Uh, we'll fix it in V4.1, but it is a bug that impacts variants that were only present. Oh, I should, sorry, I should say exome variants. So this is isolated to the exomes. So it impacts variants that were isolated in either one of the subsets of V4. So either in the UK Biobank exomes only or only in the uh, exomes that weren't in the UK Biobank. So the allele number for these variants will be correct to that subset, but it won't actually take into account the allele number across the full before exome data set. And so over here, I've highlighted another variant. You can see the allele count is one, and it's flagged with this kind of, this variant is covered in less than 50% of the exome samples. That's because of this bug. Um, so you'll see that 94% of the samples, at, if you actually look into the coverage plot again, they're greater than 20x for this variant, but the allele number is only about 500,000, so about half the size of V4. This will be fixed in the 4.1 release, but it is something that we wanted to highlight as an issue that we know occur has occurred in V4.0. And one last thing that I want to point out for this is that allele number can be variable for other reasons. So one reason could be this bug, but I would also encourage you to look at whether the variant is present in both the exomes and the genomes, or if it's just um, a capture platform difference amongst the different exomes. And I just oh, it would have impacted the frequency, yes. But there's a, a question from Deb related to that in the chat. Um, Deb, so I don't it affects know if... that calculation. It's not just a bug that like, you know, when you're like, that it just picked up some of the samples when you're viewing it. it. It also went into this page here, the group max frequency calculation. 
Yes, the group okay. max frequency calculation would have been calculated on the just the subset allele number because we wouldn't have realized that it was missing the allele number across the other subset. Got it. Okay. Yes, thanks, Casey, for describing that. And I just want to everyone to keep that in mind when I do get to talking about the population frequencies, because although there might be some that aren't as accurate, that's going to be fixed pretty soon. So just keep that in mind. Um, all right, so I'm now going to move on to talking a little bit about evaluating rare variant pathogenicity using NOMAD. Um, and to just start off to make sure we're on the same page, uh, when I'm talking about evaluating pathogenicity, I'm mostly referring to the ACMG AMP standards and guidelines that were released in 2015 um, that provided um, different evidence codes that we can use to assign to a variant to have it classified as either pathogenic or benign or variants of uncertain significance falling somewhere in between those two. And a lot of NOMAD we think about using specifically for population data. I'm going to talk about a couple other features that you can use that falls outside of this one domain category that I'm highlighting from um, the figure in that Richards paper. Um, but that is typically what people mostly think of when it comes to using NOMAD. Um, so I also want to highlight this is the link to the NOMAD page and what the browser looks like when you open it up. I've also linked here to some of the um, older primers that have been given um, that talk about some of the things I'll discuss today, um, as well as other use cases for NOMAD. So I encourage people to go look at those that are available on YouTube if you have interest. And I'm going to use um, the NF1 gene here as a gene example as I go through these features. This is the gene that's associated with um, autosomal dominant neurofibromatosis type 1. Um, and I'm highlighting here that on the gene page for any gene you type into NOMAD, um, you'll see some very general information about um, that gene. And in this case, it also highlights that the genome builds, because I'm looking at B4 in this case, um, has is, the, is HG38, like I mentioned before and gives other really um, important links that you can link out regarding the gene, like the UCSC browser. Um, I think you can link to OMIM and other resources. And another thing I personally like to highlight is that we can also see the um, now the main select transcript and the ensemble transcripts with the main select providing the ensemble and RefSeq match transcript for that. <clears throat> And then on the top right hand side of the page, we have this data set um, kind of drop down menu. Um, this shows all the different data sets and they're divided out by which ones are um, ref using the reference 38 versus 37. So you'll see the V2 browser that was um, or the V2 version of NOMAD that was in 37 down under that section. Um, and this just is a way that you can flip between those data sets if you want to look back at a different version of NOMAD. Um, but I also want to highlight that the um, that version four will not have a non-cancer data set because this data was originally recruited from the Cancer Genome Atlas, and there's not going to be a subset that was recruited for cancer included. There isn't one included in V4, so that subset won't exist. Here I'm just showing the coverage and gene model, which um, Casey already alluded to, but for any gene, you'll be able to see this map of the coverage with the y-axis being the fraction of individuals with coverage over 20. Um, it's colored to indicate um, the green being genome data and the blue representing the exome coverage. Um, and just below that, we have the gene model, which is um, in V4 follows the main transcript. So we'll have all of the black boxes representing the exons within the main transcript for the gene that you're looking at, in this case, still looking at NF1. And um, now you might have noticed that this has changed, although I'm still looking at the NF1 gene. I'm just highlighting a resource that I use really frequently that currently is still only available in V2, but will be available in V4 um, in one of the following, in one of the next releases. And this is the mean PEX track. Um, this PEX track is, you can think of as representative of um, exon level expression. It's from GTEx tissues and was work that was done by Burrell Cummings, an old grad student in the lab. Um, and it what's helpful because instead of just looking at transcript level expression, this looks at transcript, this looks at a specific position within the gene and then sums up the um, transcript level expression across transcripts for that position. So you get more of this like exon level expression versus just the transcript level. 
Um, but this is automated. The default is that it goes to, it shows you this mean text value that's again across all tissues. Um, but we do have a feature that you can show all tissues, which was, sorry, this button here next to the track that says show tissues, which will open up um, this full list of, which I've cut off slightly here just to fit it on the page, but full list of the GTEx tissues. And you can see how that expression changes if you were looking in a specific tissue versus just at the mean across all. And then if you just want to look at this in a different way, which is sometimes helpful, you can click this show transcript tissue expression, and it will show this um, kind of heat map in which the left axis, the left Y axis is all of the ensemble transcripts for the gene, and the X axis is the all of the different tissues, and it includes the mean and the median across, and it will just... Um, it allow you to quickly see um, by the darkest purple coloring of which ones have, which transcripts in which tissues have the most expression. So just another way of looking at this data. All right, so I think I'm gonna move on to constraint now, moving along. And I think a lot of us uh, think of Nomad as being really useful because of the variation that exists in the database. Um, but what is sometimes even more interesting to think about is the variation that is missing. Um, and this is really what we're thinking about when we're talking about constraint, is the absence of variance in Nomad can imply intolerance or what we call constraint. And if we think of two different um, schemes with one gene being um, a gene that's tolerant of variation and one gene that is intolerant of variation, um, as pictured on the left and right here, over time, we'll see um, variants that are that are accrued across this gene in different individuals. And for the tolerant gene, over time, most of those variants will be passed on to future generations. And in this case, um, we're showing that individual fives variant has been removed following natural selection. But in the constrained gene, most of those variants aren't passed on to are not passed on to future generations. And so over time, we um, over time we can see different patterns of variant accrual. And when we um, aggregate the across multiple samples like in Nomad, then we can see different um, amounts of variation within these different these different gene types. And it's really these patterns that help us infer constraint. And so we're able to quantify this constraint by looking at the number of rare variants that are observed in a gene within the population um, and comparing that to the number of expected variants in the gener in, in the gene um, in the population. And this expected value is something that we calculated with this mutational model um, that was done internally and also rebuilt using Nomad V4. And this model is also selection neutral. And so in this graph here, you can see that the y-axis would represent all rare variants observed in a gene, and the x-axis then represents all of the expected counts of rare variants per gene generated by that mutational model. So if we then look at this, um, the same graph, looking at synonymous variants in particular, we can see that they are highly correlated and um, also have a slope very close to one. And this is just showing that we're observing as many synonymous variants as we would expect to see um, across the population. And this tight constraint also is an indicator that um, this is a well calibrated to most genes. And when we then look at the same graph for missense variants and then loss of function variants, you'll see um, some slight differences. So for in the missense category of, or class of variants, we'll see a little bit more variation around this um, line, but the slope still seems close to one. And this variation is, um, is expected based on the more variable effect of the class of miss, like just of missense variants in general. But in the predicted loss of function variant graph, you'll see that we see a lot of this, a lot of the dots appearing below this line um, with the slope of one. And this is because we're not observing as many predicted loss of function variants as expected in the population, which does make sense because of the more deleterious nature of predicted loss of function variants. And um, most genes we see are really depleted of loss of function variation, which again makes sense based on their um, deleterious effect. 
and many are even extremely depleted with less than 20% observed compared to exit compared to the expected. And this includes most of the known curated haploinsufficient genes. Um, in this graph here on the right, I'm showing the number of genes on the y-axis and on the x-axis, the uh, that observed over expected ratio for all of the genes. And we're moving from less constrained to more constrained as you move from right to left. So in this ex specific gene example of CHD7, you can see that we're seeing around 1300 um, synonymous variants that have been observed in this gene, as well as around 1,300 expected synonymous variants. So that observed over expected ratio is close to one, um, leaning less constraint, which again makes sense for the synonymous variant class. Um, but when we look at the predicted loss of function variants in the same gene, we see that there's only 21 observed predicted loss of function variants in this gene um, compared to the almost 300 expected variants with the observer over expected much closer to zero, implying that this gene is more loss of function constrained. Um, and this makes sense because CHD7 is um, a gene that's known to cause a autosomal dominant congenital disorder called CHARGE syndrome. And so to um, to look at this loss of function constraint more as a score, um, a few years ago, they um, the team pretty much created this score of the probability of loss of function intolerance, um, also known PLI for short. Um, and the premise of it, this is that all genes can be put into three different classes, depending on their sensitivity to loss of function variation. Um, these three classes moving in this graph from right to left being the predicted null variants, which would be tolerant to loss of function variation, um, the middle category occupying these um, predicted recessive, which are genes that are um, tolerant of a heterozygous loss of function variation, and then the category all the way to the left with the um, with haploinsufficiency genes, which are intolerant to loss of function variation. And so then when we calculate this PLI score for that CHD7 gene that I've been using as an example, you can see that the PLI equals one um, and PLI does range on a, sorry, it exists on a scale from zero to one. So one being the most constrained, um, again, enforcing that this gene has um, pretty high loss of function constraint. Um, but one of the things about the PLI scores, it's actually really dichotomous. So most genes end up having a PLI score of either less than 0 0.1 or greater than 0 0.9, um, which isn't always the most useful. So um, a, I think a few years after the PLI score came out, we had a new score that is a more um, provides a more continuous metric. This is the loss of function observed over expected upper bound fraction or the LUF score. Um, and this uses the upper bound of confidence intervals to correct for small genes as well. And the LUF score also is on a scale from zero to one, um, but is actually opposite of the PLI score. So a LUF score of one is least constrained and a LUF score of zero is um, most constrained. So when we look at the LUF score for the CHD7 gene, you can see that it is um, closer to zero, which is again, following the same pattern of this gene being very loss of function constrained, but um, just showing the scores here. And um, we recalculated these LUF scores using NOMAD-V4 and applied it to three different gene lists. Um, the gene lists are described here within this graph. Um, one of them is a haploinsufficient gene list, one is an autosomal recessive gene list, and one is an olfactory gene list. And um, when we look at this graph with the y-axis being the percentage of the gene list and the x-axis being the LUF decile, again, moving from less constrained to more constrained as you move from right to left, you can see that most of the haploinsufficiency genes map to the most constrained bucket. Um, while the olfactory genes map to the less constrained um, bucket in the LUF deciles, and the recessive genes kind of fall in this middle, middle category. And this is what we would expect based on the function of these gene lists and also matches the pattern of um, the same pattern that we saw when we ran this in V2.
Um, and one major use case of the low score is to identify enriched variant classes in rare disease. So in this plot, I'm showing the de novo predicted loss of function variant and developmental disorder in cases versus controls. And um, again, here, the I'm moving on the x-axis from right to left, again, less constrained to most constrained, keeping it consistent. And the kind of pink coral color represents the V2 data set, while the teal color represents um, the V4 data set. And what you can see here is that the most constrained loop decile is showing even a stronger enrichment of de novo predicted loss of function variants in developmental disorder cases versus controls. And we see an even stronger signal in the V4 um, bar versus the V2 bar, which is again showing that um, we were able to get a little bit of a better score from this expanded V4 data set. Great, so um, how do you apply these constraint results? That might be your next question. How does this get back to curation? And so these curation, or these curations, these um, constraints scores are present um, for every gene in the NOMAD browser. Um, I actually took this one from the V2 browser, but they're also present in V4. Um, and they're present in this constraint table, which lists it very similarly to how I showed for that CHD7 example. And if you look at these constraint metrics, we get them for um, all different variant types. For the missense variants, we're provided. Oh, I'm not sure if there's a question. Um, okay, but we get the z-score to represent significant significant constraints. So the higher the z-score, the more missense constrained a gene is. Um, and for predicted loss of function variants, we have that observed over expected score. That's the loop score I described, and the PLI score that we also discussed. And how you can actually apply these um, scores to curation is in this functional data, um, a domain, I guess, of curation, where we have the PP2 category um, that states that missense in a gene with a low rate of benign missense variants and pathogenic missense, missense variants are common. So um, our team uses this score, the missense constraint score that I was shown here, that z-score, to signify um, if we can use PP2 if it's above a certain value. And some important notes um, I want to make sure I cover on constraint is that this is primarily for dominant disease genes. I kind of showed that already with showing you the spectrum of how constraints measured in autosomal recessive disease genes. Um, but we wouldn't expect to see a signal for recessive disease genes as heterozygous, um, for example, loss of function variants would be tolerant. It's also not necessarily a, strong, a sign of a strong phenotype. So we can see evidence of constraint from even mild degrees of negative selection. And um, selection does occur through reproduction. So the deleterious effect must be during reproductive years. The best example of this is um, BRCA1 does not show any evidence of loss of function constraint, but I think we're all aware that loss of function variants in BRCA1 are, um, are known to cause autosomal dominant breast and ovarian cancer risk, um, but just because we're not seeing that in this constraint table doesn't mean that, they're, that that's not true. This is a screenshot of the BRCA1 constraint table from B2, just to be clear. Um, another really amazing feature that um, KC actually worked really hard on um, for, for all of us who will look at it is this regional missense constraint. It's um, also one of the features I'm going to discuss that's currently only visible in the V2 browser, um, but will be added to V4. And this allows us to look at constraint instead of on a gene level, um, on a regional level across a gene, which can be really important to identify regions um, that are maybe hotspots within a gene or um, contain important functional domains. Um, so this shows up as a track below that hex track that I discussed earlier. Um, and you'll it's pretty easy to interpret with the darker red colors in, um, implying a higher regional missense constraint and um, gray being not any significance for missense, for missense constraint. And um, if you couldn't already tell, I was leading to this. Um, this can be used also in curation um, in some ways to identify those functional hotspots for this um, functional data domain criteria PM1, 
um, or um, hotspots or sorry, functional domains. So this can be a really useful tool to identify that if it hasn't been described in the literature, for example. Um, another feature I want to highlight is that for all nomad genes, um, this is in V4, we end in V2, but since we're encouraging you to use V4, I'm going to focus on that for now. Um, we show all of the ClinVar variants across the gene, um, and you are able to filter this. So uh, Casey actually showed this before. Uh, the gene... Before you go into this, I, I've been answering some questions in the chat, but I feel like I'm also probably just distracting people. So maybe I should just read you some of these questions. Yeah. And then and then we can get back because yeah, I'm trying Casey to the wait or <laughs> Understood. Um, so there is a question about genomic constraint and that being in V3, but not visible on V4. And you haven't really talked about genomic constraint. Do you know what that is? The, the um, no B scores? Yeah, I'm not familiar, I don't think. So there's another... Go ahead. I'll just answer it. Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to put you on the spot. Um, so, there, so this is gene-based constraint. And then um, she also talked about regional constraint, which I will send a question in Casey's way next. Um, but there's a third type of constraint, which is genomic constraint, which we initially called non-coding constraint, but it actually is just a 1 kb sliding window that goes across the whole genome. It ignores repetitive regions of the genome where we obviously don't have um, clear mapping, unique mapping across uh, repeats. Uh, but for the rest of it, it just goes in a 1 kb sliding window across the genome. And it's 1 kb because that's about the power that we have to be able to detect depletion. If we go smaller than that, there's not enough expected variation. And that was developed by C.W.H. Chen and Conrad, Conrad Karczewski. Um, and so you can see that there's like z-scores of how depleted for variation they are across coding regions and non-coding regions. And for whatever reason, that's only available on V3, in part because that's the data set it was generated on. And we probably should have on our roadmap to like add it to V4, um, but it's not something that we've done yet. Um, but that data is accessible under the V3. Um, for, uh, so Ryan asked, how far away in terms of individuals in the data set are we from finer scale constraint measures such as missense constraint at the codon level? That's a really good question. So we, we haven't redone the power analysis, but based on the power analysis that Conrad did on Nomad V2, I think we're actually right around the right spot in V4, um, but we won't know for sure until, again, we look at it. For loss of function, though, we're still actually pretty far. So I think we need another order of magnitude samples up just to even be fully powered for, for gene level constraints. So 86%, I think, of the genes in V4 are well powered to detect loss of function constraint. And by well powered, I mean you, you can expect to see at least 10 variants of those genes. That's kind of the threshold we've used historically. And then Diana asked, how does constraint apply to X linked disease? Want me to take a stab at that one? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, I and might have to correct me on this, but I'm pretty sure we don't typically see constraint for X is for X linked. Um, I'm trying to <laughs> to organize my thoughts, but um, we. We've looked at it for some of our internal work before, and um, because of carry, I think because of the females who are carriers, it can distort constraint values. Um, so it really works the best for dominant. And I think that's the only way the way it works best and the way it should be used. Yeah, and so for right now, we actually have not released constraint scores on X, on genes on the X or the Y chromosome um, on V4. It is something that Caitlin and, and Conrad Simicson are thinking about. Um, so I think they do hope to have something there eventually, but it's gonna, it's just taking a little more finesse than the standard model and so more to come there. But I, I still think if you see less, vari less loss function variation than you expect in, in the X, that means that does mean something. Um, but it's just more complicated. 
says interpret. Any do we I feel like people can also ask questions. Uh, do you want to other especially constraint questions or other things that have already been covered? Maybe focus on constraint now. We can take more general questions at the end because you don't have that much left. Anyone else have anything I didn't get to? Did you Ryan would like a dynamic constraint calculator to allow users to calculate constraint for a specific region and even discontinuous based on tertiary structures. Although Nomad code and the constraint code is open source, anyone is welcome to release a feature like that. Um, it's not something that you would need individual level Nomad access for. You could run it on the, the site's VCF. And so someone wants to make a tool like that, that sounds great. It is not something that we have funding to be able to do or bandwidth to be able to do given the large backlog of things that we are still working on to get features over from V2 to V4 and continue to make additional data sets in the future. Full factor receptors are excluded. Sorry, G-coupled protein receptor constraint and olfactory receptors. Any, some genes are excluded from constraint. They're the ones where the, there are typically mapping issues or the synonymous model is not working well for a variety of reasons. So if the constraint scores are not there, it is because the model is not performing well. And, and that's mostly what I think. Because uh, about 12,000 weak coupled protein receptors are there are olfactory, so one among them. So that's the reason I asked that question. Sorry, I still didn't hear all of that. Uh, olfactory receptors are a part of a decoupled protein receptor. There are at least 12,000 to 15,000 olfactory or decoupled receptors are there, which is having enormous functional diversity. And so they have, I don't, what's their question? I don't know whether constraint is there because I am saying a group of proteins, very important for drugs and all the type of things yep. is the coupled protein receptors. There right. are multiple families are there. The uh, olfactory receptor is one of the families. So I don't know, you have any comment on the coupled protein receptors, others involved in not many other neurological diseases. Most of the drugs are developed based upon that also. But they are all highly similar uh, repetitive type of thing. So I was curious to know how you handle this thing. So there's nothing different we've done for any genes that have like paralogs and have some mapping issues. Um, it is one of the reasons you can sometimes see, we tend to look at synonymous Z-scores. So on, on this screen here, it's Z of 1.12. So that's pretty well behaved. But there are times where the, the gene is too similar to other gene family members or has a pseudo gene that's too similar. And what you'll often see in those cases is your synonymous Z-score is elevated because you're seeing synonymous variants that are getting mismapped from multiple places in the genome. And so if, if your Z-score is off, then you can't rely on the model. If the Z-score is pretty good for synonymous, then we think it's pretty good, but we haven't done anything specific to try to like address short read mappings. This is like just standard mapping that you would do for, for any, any just, um, you know, uh, BWA mem and GATK and calling and everything. So, so there are definitely places where short read is not performing well, and we don't have a like a full list of that, so we haven't been able to flag all of those either. If anyone ever does have a way to reference places where short read is not working well that they think we should be warning people about in Nomad, um, we're happy to look into that. But we just haven't found a good resource for it. Okay, um, pass it back to Morielle and we'll take some more questions at the end. Yeah, thanks, Anne. I would say, um, just like Anne said, the chat can be pretty distracting to those who are trying to learn. So maybe let's hold on chatting too many questions, hold your questions till the end and then stick them all in the chat. That's fine and we can work through them, but maybe refrain of active chatting um, just so it doesn't distract people. Thanks, Morielle. You keep going. Yeah, and it actually scored my memory on something that I think was a really cool ad for this regional missense constraint. So I'm just going to get that in quickly here is that if you do highlight over any of these 
um, segments of the regional missense constraint track. It will tell you, um, I think, the genomic position as well as the amino acids covered within that, since not all of the breakpoints, as you can see, um, fall at the like edge of an axon, for example. So that was just something I thought was worth mentioning. <laughs> Briefly. Yeah. Zoom features is kind of cool. The zoom, yeah. Hi. What? I think I showed it a little. Okay, okay sorry. I was probably distracted by the chat. Apologies. You already did it then. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I think it's for going for. Yeah, I was like here anyway. So um, I, I think also Casey kind of alluded to it, but um, especially for large genes, I, I highly recommend utilizing the Zoom feature. Um, I think right before we stopped to take questions, I was mentioning that we um, in Nomad show the um, number, all the ClinVar variants across um, the gene that have been reported. And if you want to like be able to see this in a little more clarity, especially for if you tried to expand, uh, click this expand to all variants button for the NF1 gene, you would see that it takes up like a huge section of the page. But in this case, so that I could show this more easily, I did zoom into the first three exons in the gene. Um, you can see up here that I, that's what I've selected. Um, and this, you can get a little bit better of an idea of the breakdown of ClinVar submissions across this region. They're colored by um, the classification with the red being pathogenic and likely pathogenic. And then we also have the shapes representing the type of mutation. And this is all things that you can filter. We often use this um, to, if we want to just isolate the ClinVar pathogenic and likely pathogenic variants in a region in this case, or the entire genes so that you can see where those are localized to. Um, I think this is a really useful tool. Um, and you can also select to only show the ClinVar variants that are in Nomad. So if you also want to parse this down to which ones have been seen in the Nomad data set in entirety, it will remove all the ClinVar variants that have that are not in Nomad. Um, below that ClinVar variant section, we have the section that describes all of the Nomad variants reported in the gene. Um, and the corresponding table that lists all of those variants. This is also something that you can use to filter down if you are interested in maybe just looking at the loss of function variants across the gene, then you can filter it by that. You can also filter by um, the exome or genome data set, um, SNBs versus indels, and you can choose to show variants that have been filtered out um, following QC if you are interested in doing that. Um, I think one um, feature of Nomad that is underutilized potentially is the ability to also configure this variant table so that you can actually add um, columns. For example, I like to add the um, HGBS uh, C.NOM nomenclature. That's not usually part of the default options um, when I'm looking at variants across the gene. Um, and any way you do that, it will, um, or any filter you apply to this variant table, you are then able to export. So if you want in the full list of variants, but only the loss of function ones, if you select that filter, that's uploadable as well. Um, and one of the Nomad projects I mentioned earlier that I've actually been involved um, with heavily is looking at um, loss of function variants. Um, and the important thing here to note is that the annotation of a variant in Nomad is not necessarily um, the same as the function, I guess, or equal to the function. And so this really relates to how you would apply um, that PBS1 criteria in the ACMG AMP curation, um, which is, um, as you can see on this on this chart from the Richards paper, is the highest um, level of evidence you can apply um, like standardly across different curations. So it can be really vital to apply this correctly. Um, so what we've done in multiple projects over the last, uh, I think like four or five years, is take a closer look at these loss of um, predicted loss of function variants in Nomad. Um, I actually have an old QR code to our preprint about this, but the publication is out. Um, so I encourage you to go look at that if you want more information. Um, but so just give a quick summary of this. When we've done some manual curation of these predicted loss of function variants in um, all the homozygous predicted loss of function variants in Nomad, we found that 28% of those we predicted to not result in loss of function. Um, again, predicted results. And um, for the, we saw a pretty similar value across the heterozygous predicted loss of function variants in um, a select set of recessive disease genes. Um, while in um, haploinsufficiency genes, 
or HAPL insufficient genes um, for the heterozygous predictive loss of functions there that we performed manual curation on, we saw as high as like 60% that we predict to not be resulting in loss of function. So this is just to say that because a variant is annotated as loss of function in the NOMAD um, data set does not necessarily mean it truly looks like a loss of function variant or acts like one. Um, and I'm going to just go through uh, the variant page. So, uh, oh, is there a question before I move on? Right. Well, feel free to, or maybe some, and, or Casey can tell me if there's more questions in the chat, but I'll keep going um, for now. Um, so I've just selected a, a random variant from NF1 to show uh, um, some other features that are useful. So at the very top of the variant page, you'll see pretty basic information on the variant frequency. Again, remember what Casey has already mentioned about what the frequency in V4 is like right now. I tried to pick a variant that doesn't fall into that bug so that we don't have to <laughs> look at that for now. Um, but below this general information, you'll see more detailed um, population frequencies from the genetic ancestry groups. Um, it's broken down and ordered by the highest allele frequency. So you'll always see the, the top row representing the highest allele frequency. In this case here, um, it's showing the remaining individuals um, as the highest. That's because the allele number or the number of individuals that fall into this um, group is often much less than all of the other ancestry groups. So if we do see var um, variants within that ancestry group, it will tend to pop up to the top of the list. But you'll also see that allele frequency in the European non-finish. Um, we also have a liftover section, which is incredibly useful. It does the liftover back to HG37, um, and we'll show you the variant in V2 if it's also been seen in the V2 version of Nomad. Um, we also have a link out to use the use the variant co-occurrence tool, which I think I'll have time to talk about later, or at least briefly talk about later. And then um, you'll also have the section for the variant effect prediction, which gives you um, the annotation of this variant across all of the transcripts and highlights which um, which trans which transcript is the main select transcript. So you'll see that annotation there as well. Um, and a really new useful thing that's in V4 is that we provide multiple in silico predictors for every variant, um, ones we our team uses most being like Revel, Splice AI, and Pangolin, but you'll also get the P, Polyphen, and CAD scores as well. And they're colored according to their predicted effect. So green being um, more benign and red being more pathogenic leaning. And then if the variant's in ClinVar, there's also a section that gives you um, kind of an overview of what that variant looks like in ClinVar as well, with the ability to click out and see that in ClinVar. So here I just want to highlight that this is another place that we can use um, ACMG AMP criteria that don't fall into that population data um, category. So we are able to apply um, computational evidence based on the in silico predictors that are in nomads. It's just another way and another place that you can look at that. And then um, obviously the biggest, maybe not obviously, but the biggest highlight of the NOAD browser is being able to see how these variants are distributed across the population within NOMAD. Um, I am showing here a V2 screenshot again um, because we don't have these subpopulations yet in um, this current version of V4. Um, they will be coming soon, but for certain pop, um, global populations, we are able to see the breakdown within subpopulations, so that will be added at some point, and that's just another way that we can look at the allele frequencies in very specific population groups. And this is where you would actually apply your population data that I mentioned from the very beginning, so in curation, you can use these frequencies to apply um, evidence towards either a pathogenic or benign, depending on the frequency that you would expect. Um, quickly going to highlight this other these other features that exist on the very page that I also think are underutilized, which are um, graphics for age the age distribution of individuals um, with that variant and compared to the population and compared to individuals without that variant, um, as well as genotype quality metrics, site quality metrics, and um, we do for many variants have the IGV reads available that give you the local. Um, view of the BAM files with the variant present. 
So I mean, this is a good place if there are any more questions on the browser before I get into um, briefly statistical phasing that I can quickly answer. I'm also not seeing the chat, so. Feel free to stick them in the chat or you can hit the little raise your hand button and ask questions. And we have a question, are there timelines for a public API? We do have an API um, and it uh, is public, but it's not highly advertised. Sorry, Ann. Yeah, I would say like our, there's been a lot of discussion in the API. The API that we have supports the whole, whole Nomad browser use. So we're not really set up to be able to support uh, external queries of the API. And it's not clear that that is something we will necessarily be supporting, although it's something that's been discussed. Can you put the link to the info about the API in the chat? I know I've seen it before and I was having a hard time finding it the other day. Okay, other questions. Is there guidance for how to interpret site quality metrics? Um, I personally don't look at this too frequently, but I do think that there's usually, um, what you can obvious, more obviously see is any outliers. Um, so I think for the, I might've cut it off here, but I think you can um, compare the, easily compare the variant you're looking at compared to, or in that individual compared to the rest of the population. So if you notice that it was in more of this outlier region, like I think it's highlighting here where this variant falls in particular, then that might be an indication of some site quality issues. I'm more typically for quality I end up using the genotech quality metrics in particular, but I don't know if Anne or Casey. Well, there's details in the GTK documentation, but I agree that I don't particularly look at them. The one thing I will occasionally check is the Fisher strand bias, which is just checking us on a forward and reverse strand and seeing if that's different. But everything else, I just use GQ and up. Um, and then the one other question is, do posted V4 PLI scores account for the new or updated LOF predictions? Um, are they, uh, well, I'm not sure if you know, but are they asking about the manual curations we're talking about or? This is, that's what I assume, but Erica, feel free to, um, clarify if not. I did about this new paper you referenced, uh, yeah, yeah. Evasion. Um, is that yes. manual curation that you use? Yes, sorry. Yes, it is manual curation and it um, is currently all based on V2 as before it just came out very recently. Um, so we haven't performed or we're just starting to perform manual curation, some genes in V4. Um, but I don't know if we actually, and Anne might actually know this more than me, have plans to transfer those over to V4 yet. No, that's um, a different thing. But we don't update constraint models based on the manual curation. And we don't. Yes, that's the second part. So yeah, one useful thing for that would be, uh, especially if um, you do notice the curation's presence in dominant disease genes and notice that's loss of, function, loss of function constrained, or even just notice that there's variation, there's loss of function variation in a gene that you wouldn't expect, is I would just encourage you to take a closer look at those variants. It's usually much fewer than in recessive disease genes um, and see if you notice anything that is like a glaring thing. But I encourage you to read the paper to get more detail on that. Or follow up with me after, also an option. Okay, right. I think you can head to the last bit. All right, I might have to breeze through this a little bit, but um, this uh, statistical phasing is mostly work that's been done with the people listed here. So Michael, Laurent, Sarah, and Julia. Um, and the goal is to use haplotype patterns in NOMAD to infer phase of rare variant pairs. Um, and there are two um, goals within this project. One is to produce a tool for the medical genetics community to phase variants found in their patients. And the second to produce a, resources, a resource counting rare variant co-occurrence in NOMAD by functional consequence. Um, so just starting off with some background, variant phase is really critical to rare disease diagnosis and we can't readily distinguish phase from short read data. Um, it does require parental sequencing to determine transmission. So the question you're asking here is, um, can we use NOMAD to, um, to infer phase for rare variants? So if we can infer that variants are seen in cis in the population or trans in the population, does that also infer that they're in cis in an individual or in trans in that individual? 
And this is a really busy slide, but I just want to highlight that um, we uh, can assume that bulk segments of DNA or haplotypes are shared among a population, which also means that we can uh, assume that a variant that's seen in trans in a population would be seen in trans in an individual and, and the same for variants that are in cis. So we use this method to estimate haplotype frequencies and use these to infer phase of rare variants um, and give them this p-trans value. Um, and to uh, validate this method, we tested this in 5,000 trios, um, a truth set that were um, processed with the NOMAD data set, but were not um, part of NOMAD. And this had, these trios had about 400,000 variant pairs. Um, for all these, we calculated P-trans, or we calculated P-trans for all of these variant pairs, ended up with this bimodal distribution that you can see here, um, in which many, very, Many of the pairs fell in this high P with this high P trans value or very low P trans value. The high being associated with variants predicted to be in trans, and the low for variants predicted to be in cis. And then we used this um, rock curve to determine to define the thresholds for what would be called um, predicted in trans and predicted in cis, with the red li vertical line indicating the predicted in trans threshold and the um, blue representing the predicted in cis threshold with an accuracy of about 94%. And we also wanted to validate this across multiple allele frequencies. So here I'm showing um, this accuracy defined by the number of variant pairs given a correct classification over the total classifications separated by variants in trans and variants in cis variants in cis, excuse me. And what you can see here is across, um, and, oh, sorry, in the y-axis he, axes here represent the allele frequency of the variant that has a higher allele frequency in the variant pair. And the x-axis represents the, um, the variant that has the lower allele frequency in the variant pair. And you can see for variants in trans, accuracy was really high across um, all of the allele frequencies, but for variants in cis, um, if the variants had concordant um, allele frequencies, it was a really high accuracy, but it drops a little as those uh, allele frequencies become discordant between the two variants. And we also calculated the haplotype estimates for all genetic ancestry groups and the overall being this cosmopolitan score. Um, you can see that the accuracy is really similar for variants predicted in cis, but um, if possible, for variants predicted in trans, we do recommend using the, um, the group-specific genetic ancestry estimates. Um, and just in brief, there are kind of two major things that can impact this accur the accuracy of this phasing. Um, those, one of them being the distance between the variants, um, because recombination can disrupt haplotypes, but we also know that um, variants that are located in close, um, in a close range of each other, especially those within the same gene, do have a lower rate of recombination, and recurrent, mu recurrent mutations as well um, can have an effect on the phasing accuracy as um, if variants arise independently multiple times through within the population, that will affect the genetic relationship between those two variants. Um, so we did uh, test this um, this phasing tool in a select selected patients with recessive disease from the Center for Mendelian Genetics and the Gregor Consortium, um, where all the variant pairs were presumed to be heterozygous. So we started with 627 variant pairs. Um, and when we looked at which of the ones were actually present in OMAD, we came down to 293. And of those, 200, about 280 or 95% of those were predicted in trans, um, and nine of them were predicted in cis. And oops, there we go. And all of the of those nine variants predicted in cis, so the ones that were a little discordant here, six of them had only proband sequencing. So um, we weren't able to validate those clinically if those variants were in trans or not. And the other three that we did have through sequencing, um, the phase prediction was incorrect here. But overall, the accuracy of this looked pretty solid in this. And I think we're at time, so I'm kind of running out. Um, but these tools I'll just go through do exist in NOMAD. Um, and there's another tool that I didn't have time for that I'll skip over to. 
um, ooh, that shows the um, two rare variant counts in the table. So, yeah. And maybe we could also just revisit these at the beginning of the next call. Sorry yeah. that I took too much time for questions here. Apologies. I feel like we were yeah, going they, very fast and then we had like a lot of time. And yeah. Yeah. No, it's okay. I think you can briefly, as we prepare the QA slides, maybe talk about these two features later so it's not rushed. But um, thank you so much to the Nomad team, Moriel. Thank you for the great presentation and, and Casey for fielding questions and everyone for the great questions. Um, please do fill out the form if you have questions. It really helps us to tee up, tee up these answers with some screenshots and things like that. So thanks everyone for their time today and we'll talk again in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Bye all.